Коли зараз у нас буде брифінг на тему Dear colleagues, so now we will have the briefing on the topic uh, U.S. sanctions policy. And uh, Daniel Fried we have here, who is the coordinator of the U.S. Department uh, on sanctions uh, policy. The briefing will be held by Daniel Fried, who is the coordinator of State Department, U.S. State Department for sanctions policy. І прохання, будь ласка, візьміть прилади для синхронного перекладу, тому що брифінг буде англійською мовою. Дякую. Добрий день. Thank you for coming. I and my colleagues from the Department of Treasury and the Department of State uh, came to Kyiv for consultations with the Ukrainian government at the invitation of the Ukrainian government, both to explain the sanctions the United States has imposed on Russia for its actions against Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and also to discuss with the Ukrainian government its thinking, Ukrainian thinking, about the possibility of its own sanctions regime. It's the view of my government that consultations about sanctions are critical to the effectiveness of sanctions. The United States developed its own sanctions in close consultation with the European Union and other key allies such as Canada, Australia, and Japan. In retrospect, this was the right thing to do, and our sanctions were stronger for it. We've made the same recommendation to Ukraine, that Ukraine consult with key partners, that it work with the European Union, and that any sanctions that it imposes or considers need to be firmly rooted in law, based on evidence, transparent. No one needs any more telephone justice here or anywhere else. And that sanctions be reversible because the purpose of sanctions, after all, is to help create the conditions under which you don't need sanctions anymore. My colleagues and I have had an excellent set of meetings so far. We believe that the Ukrainian government wants to work with us and with other partners such as Europe to develop its options and to do so in a way which is solidly rooted, as I said, in law based on facts, transparent and understandable, and designed to be reversible, because all of us need to look past the present difficulties to a time in which things may be better, and better between Russia and Ukraine, which is our hope, though, though those decisions are mainly that, of, that for Russia to make. So I'm happy to have the opportunity to take your questions, but let me emphasize it again. My colleagues and I have had a good set of discussions with the Ukrainian government. We explained our thinking about sanctions, our process in developing sanctions authorities and making individual sanctions decisions. And we look forward to continued close consultation with the Ukrainian government. This is a difficult time for Ukraine and for Ukrainians. But my government, as President Obama has said repeatedly, supports the Ukrainian people and its sovereignty and its right to make its own decisions about its future. This is the right of every people and the Ukrainians are trying to exercise it under difficult conditions. And in the face of interference from abroad and from Russia. 
and we wish the Ukrainian people and its government well as it deals with this problem. And we are prepared to do whatever we can to help, working closely with our allies. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Fried. Tell me, please, could you assess those sanctions that Ukraine can introduce, and what do you know about uh, those sanctions? And what what will be what is the, the response uh, of Russia to sanctions? How how those sanctions will be sensitive uh, for uh, the U.S. Uh, for Ukraine and for other countries? First, I don't want to comment on any sanctions that Ukraine may decide to impose. That's for the Ukrainian government. Um, I, with respect to Russia's retaliation, I, like you, have read press reports and read statements by the Russian government. I'm, I admit I don't understand how depriving the Russian people of access to good food is going to help anyone. But that happily is not for me to say. Uh, I will leave it to the Russian government to explain why keeping food out of the hands of Russians is a good thing. Thank you. Uh, this is a little bit on the same thing. Uh, I'm with the Washington Post. Could you be specific about uh, possible areas for sanctions? Or it's, I guess it's kind of surprising to me that Ukraine is still, try still doing business with the country that it's at war with? Well, I don't want to comment about Ukraine's own policy. Obviously, um, Ukraine is under extreme pressure right now in the face of Russian intervention and aggressive behavior, to say the least. It is, I think, a good thing that Ukraine, rather than react impulsively and emotionally, is taking the trouble to think through its options, to root, to root them soundly in law, in good practice, to have them developed in a way which is consistent it appears with the values that Ukraine aspires to. It is always possible to engage in, you know, I guess the phrase is telephone justice, arbitrary, non-transparent decisions without firm legal standing. Shall we call that the old way of doing business? Maybe. But if Ukraine wants to take the time to develop its options, including on sanctions, in a way that is consistent with the rule of law, which is defensible in court, which is based on transparent and understood criteria, and has the aim of supporting Ukraine's sovereignty, more power to them. And we are more than ready. We are enthusiastic about supporting this kind of thoughtful, transparent, legally based system. It's good that the government is, appears to be taking the time to do the right thing rather than rushing to do the wrong thing. Hello, my name is Alex Harko with Civod New UA. My question would be to you, uh, well, in figures, what, 
What's your evaluation of how much Russia has already lost on the sanctions? And how much is it about to lose in the nearest future? What's the forecast for that? It's hard to answer that question specifically with any confidence. Now, one figure we have used is, I believe, an IMF estimate of capital flight from Russia um, supposed to reach about $100 million this year. And that was an estimate calculated before the recent US and European Union and other sanctions. So I think it likely that that number will rise. It is also hard, hard to calculate or quantify the number of lost deals, investment that hasn't happened, uh, the losses from restrictions on technology and the recent sanctions, uh, well, the recent restrictions on certain kind of banking activities by certain banks, state-owned banks in Russia. Those are hard to quantify. As a general rule, though, we think that the impact on Russia of the sanctions Europe and the United States have already introduced and introduced months ago before this latest round has been more significant than the immediate impact of the sanctions themselves. That is, the indirect impact of the sanctions has been greater than the direct impact. We're fairly confident in making that judgment. And if that pattern holds true now, then the indirect and total impact of the most recent European, American, Canadian, and other sanctions will be greater yet. President Obama has stated clearly that the Russian economy already weak will take another big hit. How big that is, I can't say but it will be significant. And as I suggested before, the Russian retaliatory steps may end up hurting Russia even more. And again, I don't know why the Russian government would think it is in Russia's interest to deprive the Russian people of access to food. But this is for them to explain, not for me to speculate. Valeria Kondratova, Liga Business Inform. Liga Business Inform. There is an opinion that Russia holds uh, from a direct uh, aggression only sanctions. If you introduce sanctions all the time, there will be uh, there can be a breaking point, and uh, Russia will have so nothing to lose, and then there will be uh, invasion. What is what is worse, uh, a threat of sanctions or sanctions by themselves? It's an interesting point, but you cannot forever threaten sanctions and never act or else the threat itself becomes meaningless. So it is important, and the United States, working very closely with the European Union, acted. We acted last week, and we acted together with the European Union and other key partners. It is also true that we have not exhausted the potential of sanctions. You said that Russia may conclude that it has nothing left to lose. Russia still has plenty to lose. And although I cannot speak for the thinking of the Russian government, it is clear that the United States and its partners are determined to continue to support Ukraine's sovereignty. We hope that Russia will reconsider the course it is now on. It would be better for all if it did, but we will do what we must. Thank you. My name is Stash Lishka from Longitude. Uh, my question is, the US wants to be on the same page with, uh, with Europe on the sanctions. What are the main obstacles to proceeding with uh, what I assume the United States wants uh, to have more aggressive sanctions. 
what are some of the main obstacles in Europe and what are some of the main obstacles within the United States, within the U.S. business community, for example? I applaud the European Union for its strong sanctions announced last week. This was a demonstration of Europe's ability to think and act strategically. And the United States, in making an early decision to closely coordinate our sanctions with Europe, made the right decision. And we can intend to continue such coordination with Europe and close consultation. You spoke in terms of obstacles. Well, the challenge in sanctions policy is to develop sanctions which are most effective against the intended target with least damage to yourself and a low, relatively low threat of collateral economic damage, if you would. Sanctions need to be thought through. They need to be smart rather than dumb. And the challenge, therefore, is to think through the options carefully, consult closely, and then when the time comes for action, act. We intend to do so if we have to. But unilateral sanctions are a far weaker and more vulnerable option than sanctions done with a group of partners. And so far, the United States and Europe and other, other countries, Canada, Australia, Japan, and others, have done the needful, and we, inti we intend to continue doing so. What governs by the Ukrainian week? Uh, so, uh, German uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Frank Walter Steinmeier, said that um, the sanctions itself are not a policy. So, what is the policy of US and the EU beyond the sanctions in this case? Well, our policy is to support Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the right of the Ukrainian people to choose their own future. That's what we want. Sanctions are not a policy. They are a policy tool. Sanctions are not an end to themselves. They are not a good thing or a thing we enjoy doing. They are a necessary, difficult policy option, which we have taken as one but only one of steps to support the policy I just mentioned. Other steps include economic support for Ukraine and Ukraine's economic and other reforms. Uh, we have shown our political support for the Ukrainian government. We have made it clear that we will help Ukraine uh, in the effort to reconstruct uh, the East when the time comes. What we do, that is the United States, the international democratic world, um, the international financial institutions, what we can do is to help the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people do what only they can do. And we believe that this government is working well under very difficult circumstances, and we intend to continue to work with them. Thank you. Руслан Дениченко, Голос Америки. Голос Америка. Hard enough to find a way to avoid these sanctions, like finding other countries who can supply goods or technologies. Uh, do you work with uh, other partners who uh, can either support Ukrainian sovereignty, uh, Ukraine? Of course, of course. Um, I mentioned recently that unilateral sanctions are really a weak option, and it's f exactly for that reason. Uh, if you go it alone, your sanctions may be tough on paper, but not terribly effective in reality. But when you move with your key allies, when you move with the European Union, with Japan, with Canada, with Australia, and with other countries, sanctions have considerably more weight. We are working with other countries as well. Now, you mentioned that Russia could find ways to get around sanctions. 
as a general rule, sanctions work over time, and they are they often comprise different layers. Uh, the United States government, Department of Treasury, Department of State, Department of Commerce, has learned a lot about sanctions over the years. And we have learned to discover and then eliminate loopholes, tighten uh, the sanctions, and make them more effective over time. Now, I must emphasize sanctions are only one element of our policy. I'm mentioning them because I'm the sanctions guy. That's what I do. But that is, it is not the only element of our policy. It is an element that requires investment of time, energy, and persistence. But we are determined to do what we need to do to make the sanctions regime most effective uh, and with always the eye on creating the conditions under which we can remove sanctions because we want to create the conditions under which the sanctions are no longer necessary. That's our objective, after all. Uh, Michael Dosenko, the U.S. Ukraine Business Council. Uh, Mr. Fried, uh, in law there is a concept of uh, repairing, restoring damages uh, that some, uh, somebody incurred uh, because of actions of others uh, through potentially the assets of that person who, uh, who created the injury. Uh, with that in mind, when it comes to uh, the U.S. Uh, Treasury uh, freezing assets, potentially seizing assets of uh, the Yanukovych government, of uh, maybe certain Russian officials uh, who are responsible for the damages that Ukraine has incurred, uh, is there um, thinking of perhaps uh, uh, those assets being then transferred to Ukraine? Uh, because we know most of the time, normally, uh, the United States keeps the assets that it freezes or seizes. The freezing assets is an integral part of the U.S. sanctions system. Um, generally speaking, the U.S. Department of Treasury administers that sanctions regime. The Office of Foreign Assets Control, they're very good at what they do. They're diligent, uh, quite skilled. Confiscating, seizing assets is very different legally. That involves different processes. It is not, technically speaking, a, a sanction um, in our system. That's a separate process. There is a process, <clears throat> I don't mean to evade the question, there is a process going on of looking for those assets. Um, that's not my area, so I don't want to say too much about it. But you've raised a perfectly reasonable point, which is the can the stolen assets be returned to the Ukrainian people um, from whom they were taken, uh, which is a different process. There is a process, an international process underway um, to see what can be done. But that's not my process nor the um, subject of my team's uh, efforts uh, these days in Kyiv. And um, if final allow, question. Uh, if you will allow me a yeah. question on behalf of the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center. Um, Ambassador Fried, when European Union introduced sanctions last week, uh, they've also said that these sanctions will not be applicable to contracts which have been uh, concluded in the past, which means France is still entitled to sell the infamous Mistral to Russia. So the question is, does it not send the wrong signal to Russia? Uh, is it not counterproductive and shouldn't um, the world community uh, try to convince France to find an alternative to selling its warship to the country which is now behaving uh, quite aggressively towards Ukraine? Thank you. That's a perfectly reasonable question. Uh, the views of my government about this sale are well known. Uh, it's not me you have to convince. So I, you may want to put that question um, to the proper addressee. However, that said, um, France joined and in the f final days helped lead the European Union to a consensus on sanctions, on the issue of defense 
our sale of defense articles, the so-called arms embargo, it indeed was forward-looking. That is, it allowed for the sale of the Mistral. But nevertheless, we were pleased by the European Union package of sanctions. We were glad that Fla France played a, a, a strong role in putting together that package. And the fact that we may have a difference of view over the, um, the Mistral sale, which we do, uh, should not detract from the accomplishment. Um, we need to look and, at areas of agreement and build on it. Uh, it's easy to fight, uh, better to build, and the sanctions package passed by the European Union is strong, and we will be looking um, to work with the European Union to make sure it's implemented in the strongest possible way. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much. You.